be where you are. Michelle Heard also said this on set, just imparted all of this beautiful knowledge to me. She still finds so much joy in every opportunity that she gets to audition. Because I get to be an actor today. That's what Michelle says. I get to be an actor today. The way she says it, she means it. I am Matt Drago. I'm an actor, producer. I started Dragon Hunter Productions. You can look me up at Matt Drago on Instagram, at Dragon Hunter Productions. Both of those are websites too, mattdrago.com, dragonhunterproductions.com. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a multi-talented actor-producer in an amazing new upcoming film in 2025 called Somewhere in Montana. We're joined by the ever-talented Matt Drago. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Kurt. Thank you so much for having me today. Well, it's good having you on. First off, I have to say I was blown away by the images on the IMDb website for this film. I mean, it must have been a beautiful place to film at, to be an actor. And for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking today. Matt Drago, I uh, just honestly caught the bug as uh, soon as I can remember. Always wanted to be an actor, love telling stories. Grew up in a rural town of Front Royal, Virginia. Got into theater very, very early, and the natural progression for me was, how can I keep this going? I did regional theater in Virginia. My mom and dad are originally from New York City, so moved back for college. Lived with my grandma for a few years and just auditioned, auditioned, auditioned. Went to Actors Equity. You know, just hit up every audition, every off-Broadway, off-off-Broadway play that I could, just took in the city and just really embraced what it is. It's such a great medium to really just kind of get as much as you can out of the human experience, but also hopefully really just making people feel, making people just kind of more in touch with their own humanity. I feel like acting and the creative arts, there's just nothing like it in the world. I'm kind of in the industry, but I'm not in the industry. I'm not in front of the camera. I'm always behind the camera myself. I produce an IDIT and I do all of those fun things because that's just what I love doing. We need you. And I need to be hired. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's tough out there, to be honest, for entertainment, for the media, for just you know, being creative in general, we, we had a pandemic and, you know, it came down to the fact that we were able to be more creative, I think, in those three years than we have been in our entire lives because we were forced to be by ourselves. We were forced to focus in on our own creativity and what drives us as people. And I think yourself as an actor and a producer, I'm sure you must have had some interesting stories that you're, you're going to be filming in the upcoming years, but we'll talk about that a little later. What is a misconception then about being an actor? that people who aren't in the industry misunderstand. It's harder than it looks. I mean, a lot of times people broadcast, obviously, their wins, their red carpets, their press, but, you know, that's just to try to get the next job. Uh, the day in, day out for most actors, and I might not be including, like, the movie star, <laughs> tip of the top totem pole thing. For most actors, it's really just a love of the game and it can be long days and we really care and we fully invest in the characters we do a, a lot of work i love doing backstory for my characters for um, the specific role i had two years to prepare for it which in a way is kind of too much because you get <laughs> obsessive about it to a yeah. certain point but my character is very obsessive, so it sort of worked out. He is really focused on his legacy, as many people are, and that's what this film is about. So, you know, when it comes to craft of an actor, it's just finding your own process, letting that guide you, just kind of enjoying the journey of it. So much of acting and the acting career is out of your control. And so I think that the best thing that you can do is really just manage that by enjoying the day to day of it. Every time you get to be creative is a gift. Every time you get an audition is a gift. And I feel like I'm really in that sweet spot right now where I'm just appreciating any opportunity that, that comes my way. I would be remiss if I didn't ask, you know, what is Somewhere in Montana about? Amazing cast, beautiful location, but tell us what the film is about. It's a story of the times. I play a West Coast director that's coming into a Montana rancher's world and the two worlds just collide. It's a story of the times in the way that people don't know how to talk to each other. They don't know how to see each other. You know, I'm 
between a rock and a hard place as Fabian trying to get this last part of my film, which is like a legacy piece for me, shot. And I need a location for that. And it happens to be John Graham McTavish's ranch. We just butt heads right off the bat, as many people do right now in society. We find ways to try to work through that. I don't want to give too much away, but it really is. It's a powerful story because we dive deep into the psychology of what separates people in our modern society you know, how we judge each other, how we cancel each other. And I feel like part of this journey for me, which a lot of it was off screen, the joy of really just getting to be in Montana and see how much this film meant to these people, the little corner of the world that it took place in. Really, it just, it resonated with this town because they really like became part of the production. It was a really magical experience where you're going to, you know, a little cafe or you're meeting people in town and they're like, oh, you're making this film. And thank you so much for telling, you know, a, a story about our, our little corner of the world. And I really do. I think that right now we need to invest in people being heard, because I think that's where a lot of the dissonance in our society is coming from. And so when I say that it's a story of the times, I do, I believe that it's a story that can bring people together. It's an indie film. So being on podcasts such as yours today, and spreading that word of mouth is really important, because we obviously don't have the big marketing budget that some of these films do. But we're relying on that word of mouth because the, the film in and of itself as an actor, it's what I've always dreamed of being a part of. It really is. It's a powerful story. The best part of it was the cast and crew. We all came together and we just knew from day one this was a story that was bigger than ourselves. We're just so grateful to tell it. So somewhere in Montana, a story of the times, trying to find mutual respect. And, and that's the greatest form of love in the world, I think. That's what I found interesting, like looking at the cast and crew, dude, because you, you can't have a film without the crew or, or the cast for that matter, or else it's just a, a one, one person play. You know, what are we enjoying? How are we consuming our media? And how do we get the word out there? Because I think, like you said, and you mentioned about canceling and you mentioned about the grassroots and the social media and the word of mouth, you know, people don't take that into full consideration because it's difficult enough to make a project like this it's even harder to get the attention of the masses for that matter too. Looking at the cast then specifically here, who is in this cast other than yourself, obviously. And if you could summarize their work ethic in one word, what would that be? Well, Graham, you know, you never know when you're showing up to set. We met in the most extraordinary way. He was there for two weeks. I was there for six weeks. So he was a condensed schedule. When he came, I actually was feeling like I was picking up part of a cold, so I just went to Walgreens and just bought everything. Graham had just been picked up at the airport, and he wanted to make one stop before he went to his hotel, his Airbnb. The producer walks by, sees me, and she's like, oh my god, I just picked up Graham. That's where I met him, was at the Walgreens. We just kind of found each other, right place, right time in Polson, Montana. Graham is a pro. I couldn't be more grateful for him. I think he really gave me the time and the space for us to tell this story collectively together because there's a scene in the movie that is 10 pages long and it's just the two of us, which is very rare in modern cinema, but we go there. We have all of the difficult conversations that you would think people need to have that don't. And we show it to people in a way that we really believe is responsible, truthful, honest. I think that's the way that we really wanted to do it. And honestly, everybody, I, I, I will say Graham is a true pro. Michelle Hurd, she became like a big sister to me. She's just... She's fire. She's amazing. She is a lover of actors. She has everybody's back. The cast, everyone. I mean, we were so close. We would go on hikes together. We would go to dinners together. I had a real feeling when we showed up to set that this was going to become a family. Mm -hmm. And it really was. I don't just say that. I know a lot of people say, oh, we were so close. This is that. No, we really, really were everyone. We would just 
crack jokes, Kate Orsini. She is a blast. Everybody, like every single person that was in the cast really came together because we really, really did know that this was a story bigger than all of us. And I mean that the crew too, they had just such great energy on set. They sacrificed so much to, they needed to build something. Cause again, it's an indie, there's not enough time, right? And you're shuffling things together, but everybody was just so on board. And the best part of this is that I have all these relationships past this film that I can take into you know my life. And hopefully these are people that I can work with again as I move forward to you know, producing my first feature film. So when you think about a booking or getting the role as an actor, a lot of times see that as, a lot of people see that as forward facing, mm. the big break or, or this and that. I think a lot of that comes with just really the experience because the experience in and of itself is so magical. It's so earth shattering and it all comes down to people. Yeah. It really does. It comes down to just the experience and you mentioned it when we started the podcast today. I mean, Montana is heaven on earth. I mean, to shoot a film there, to wake up every morning, to be looking at those mountains and that beautiful Flathead Lake in Polson, Montana, like it just grounds you, it centers you. There's like no better place to be an artist than in Montana. And so I hope that this is the first of many films that I get to shoot up there because it really was. It changed my life. In working on this film, especially for six weeks, that's a, that's a fair amount of time, especially for a feature in, in that respect as an actor. What was your biggest personal breakthrough then while you were acting in somewhere in Montana? My biggest breakthrough was actually realizing how much I was learning about the experience of the character okay. by being offset in the town of Polson, hmm. Feeling the need for stories like this to be told about things that aren't told right i mean a montana rancher it doesn't seem so glamorous well it's not but it is a legacy and everybody has a legacy and everybody's legacy matters unfortunately in more complicated societies right because i've lived in new york city i've lived in la we're all about social media we're fast paced it's not good or bad it's just what it is people in montana a lot of them they just want to be where they are do what they do and take pride in it i mean what was amazing was we actually shot the film on an active cattle ranch and we became friends with the people that owned the cattle ranch and in the film john graham's character is worried about having a film crew on the ranch. And in real life, the people that owned the ranch also were worried about having a film crew on the ranch because it becomes part of the tapestry of your legacy and your story. And I think when they started to meet people in the cast and we started to grow really close with them, they would make us breakfast we would hang out with their grandkids. They would show us around. They would tell us about stories on the ranch. And it just kept feeding into my character's arc, which I would say is probably the greatest arc of the story because I'm the outsider and I'm wired and I'm passionate and I need to get this done and I care. And there was a fine line with my character development, which was how big do I go? Because this guy is big. He's passionate about what he does, but he will go down with his ship. And I think that's what I wanted to show. I wanted to show that, yes, he could be a little bit of a diva if he needed to be, but it's because he cared. It wasn't egotistical. It was it was motivated by passion. And I think that's where I felt like the character needed to go because I felt like that was the way for all of the other characters on the Montana side to see me as a person as I was trying to see them as people. Social media is a tricky thing, right? We get into this world and we see one thing that we don't like that someone says and we just create this whole narrative about that person. And it was extraordinary for me 
as someone that has been living in New York City and L.A., to learn that as the character, but also learn that as Matt and have that inform the character. I really did. I, I said when I wrapped the film, all of these elements and all of this love and just being in this magical little town in Montana for a month and a half, all I had to do, my job as an actor, was to bring all of that energy in, all of that just good spirit that I'd been feeling for the last month and a half, and then just put it right back into the film. And that's what was magical about it. And I really do. I think this story is something that I will look back on as Matt and just feel the legacy of it, because it's something that I've always dreamed of being a part of, is telling stories that matter stories that move people, stories that make them question, maybe I could do that a little bit better. Or maybe I could have said that a little bit better. Or maybe I should have given that person, you know, a little bit more of a chance because we're not one decision in our lives and we shouldn't be made to feel that we are. We shouldn't be put through that burden. And I think this story really speaks to that. Talk about the director and writer, Brandon Smith, of course, from the creation of Somewhere in Montana here. As an actor, how was working with Brandon and how did that help you uh, kind of solidify your role uh, when it came to the collaboration between your conversations with him? The collaboration pretty much started right away and that's because I am playing a director in the film and the best thing that I could do is to almost understand how he runs a set. So I actually asked to get to set the earliest so I could shadow him for a couple of days and just really learn how to run a set and just be around the crew, feel like I knew how to be in charge because it's not my medium. I'm an actor, but I'm an actor playing a director. So I felt like it was a great opportunity for me to shadow him and really take all of that in. Brandon was an incredible collaborator into rehearsal with me. We would get on Zoom such as this and we would go through scene by scene by scene because he wrote a lot of himself into the role of Fabian. Uh, in a way, he, he has told me this before, he wrote essentially himself into the two lead characters of the film, in John and Fabian, the director and, and the Montana rancher. It, it is basically a schism of, of, of him. And so when I got this role, I felt the responsibility of making sure that I was telling his my part of the film to the best of my ability in the ways that when things were hard for Brandon as a director that I was you know really leaning into that that I was doing justice to it and one of the coolest things was uh, his wife Judy who is just I say she, I call her kind eyes because she's just got the kindest eyes being on set with her she did costume design and a lot of times I would have a highly emotional scene and I would go to Judy and, and I was like, did, did we get it? Did we get it? And, and she would just be like, you know, and, and tears would be streaming down our faces. And it was just very gratifying to just kind of have that type of collaboration to almost have the space really for us to have a whole year where we would go through the scenes. And I was very lucky with Brandon that he really let me be the actor he didn't give me line reads he just showed me through his own experiences how he felt the story needed to be told and what better person than the person that was telling it right we really enjoyed that process i go back to that actually all the time just thinking about things that i miss about you know the production and pre-production of somewhere in montana and i do i remember like the simplicity of just going through the script because I actually read it again recently, even after I finished shooting, which I know is crazy, but you kind of go back to it because you miss it, right? When you shoot a scene, you're giving it away kind of for the final time. That's what exists, right? So I do, I really reminisce about those times that I got to spend with Brandon and just kind of going through the different scenes together and just trying to find that like real core motivation, core emotion to the story that we were trying to tell. And then it just blossomed. When I had other actors around me, Kaylee, Tasha, Kate, Jonathan, I mean, Andrew, just so many great actors on set, uh, along with Graham and Michelle, to just tell this story with, I felt like I didn't really 
even know what was going to happen at that point because the preparation was already there. That in and of itself is when you feel like you're in the sweet spot of acting where you've done so much work and so much backstory that you come to set and you just don't even know what's going to happen on that scene where you're having a nervous breakdown or you know fighting for your career or your dream you feel like anything's possible but that's just because of the love that's created around you i truly truly believe that when you watch a film a lot of times you can feel the energy that comes through it and that that comes a lot of times from the production it comes from just the joy of it and we just we had such great joy making this film it really was a passion project originally for for brandon but really it became a passion project for all of us now without going into spoiler territory because obviously you know you don't want to spoil your your film in reading the script what was the hardest scene for you to act in that turned out way better than what was in the script itself i mean i probably would say the 10 page scene just because it's a very meaty scene yeah. lucky for me graham and i would just go to dinner go to breakfast talk about it we knew it was coming up it was hefty it was hefty in the way that we didn't want to make it feel too precious we just really wanted to make it feel like a conversation we really honestly had a lot of conversations about the conversation and i think that's when we showed up to set and we started with it because it goes through so many different levels it's in two different locations at the ranch house and the barn. It really just became easy, but it was because of the conversations that we had beforehand. There's a lot of dialogue in that scene that could come off very, I don't know, trite or um, surfaced because they are hot button, button topics. But I think that the way that we worked through all of the things that we felt were actor traps, I guess you could say. We really did find ways to communicate like two people in that space, in that moment, would communicate. And I think that is a one of many examples of just the relationships that were built on that set. Because I think you see it in, in many examples. I mean... There's a, a scene with, with Michelle and I that didn't make the film, but sometimes, that th sometimes there are scenes that you need to shoot because they enforce the moments of that relationship that you have on screen with them. You only get so much time to invest in different relationships of your character with other characters but a lot of these relationships blossomed in in real life. And I think that they really um, showcased the relationships that existed in the film. One, I will say, is my great friend, uh, Andrew Roa, and we go golfing together. And it's funny that he kind of became a Bob to me in real life. And Bob is sort of one of those, you know, middle guys, the guy that brings people together and understands where the pain point is. And we've all had those people in our life. And he did some extraordinary work on set, bringing in his Native American roots, um, you know, doing some of his tribal chants on set. And everybody did that. That was what was amazing. Everybody needed this film in a way. And I think you really can feel that. Everybody really, really needed this film. Everybody needed that camaraderie. And it just wasn't an acting gig. It wasn't a job. Like, it felt really, really big. And it felt really important. And I think that's why I love talking about it. Like, I love being on podcasts such as yours because I really, honest to God, just want people to see it. I want them to talk about it. I always say that, the magic of this film is made in those two minute conversations walking out of the theater because we need you to tell two of your friends that are going to tell four of your friends, you know, and that's where indies live. Human stories matter now more than ever. As we get into a more digital age, a more AI driven age, we need stories that kind of go back to basics that really just speak to our innate 
humanity. I just couldn't be prouder of this film. You see the art of storytelling in film and cinema, 50s through 80s, 90s. It started to, you, you got a bit of a formula there as well. When it started getting to the early 2000s, it seemed like the art of storytelling slowly started to get either more formulaic or it started to kind of take a little bit of a downturn where human stories didn't matter. It's what is the formula to make the most money. And it's unfortunate to see, and I'm glad to see indie films like this, which have a great cast, great crew. You you know, you're passionate. You can hear the passion in your voice. You can see it in, in your expression. And I'm sure we're going to see it on screen as well with all the amazing talent that's currently there. So I think it just comes back to the word of mouth will help once we see, you know, it in theaters or where, however it's being uh, distributed. Uh, I think a lot more people will gravitate towards this style of storytelling once more. Absolutely. And the, the trailer is out. It's actually oh. on my Instagram. If you check uh, at Matt Drago, I pinned it right on the top. <laughs> it's an incredible trailer cut by John Shimke, the editor of the film. It's extraordinary. And it really is beautiful trailer. Like I was floored when I saw it. It really does. It shows that humanity from both sides. It's a very unique film in that both of the lead characters are protagonists and antagonists. We are heroes of our own journey, but we do antagonize each other. Make no mistake. So there's a lot of dissonance from the get-go. We dive deep in that because I think there's a real uniqueness in having two characters that are really just trying to understand the other person, but find themselves at the same time. Very interesting journey with Graham and I in the film, because I think that we just really dove headfirst into that. Kind of in the beginning, both suck, you know? <laughs> we are not at our best. And I think that's reminiscent of a lot of people right now, if we're being honest. We do things and we say things that we later regret. And maybe we just need to take a breath. Maybe we just need to try to understand the person in totality a little bit more. And it's still okay to disagree with them. And it's still okay to not be on the same page with certain things. But I swear, you start to lean in on the commonality that you do have with people and all of that angst, all of that negativity that you feel towards that person, it really does start to melt away. It truly, truly does. I, I'm not just saying that. Like, if you really start to see the person in totality and you start to understand their family and their dynamic and what they're striving to do in their life and who they care about, well, then you might not care as much about their political views or, you know, how, how, how they see religion or the hot button topics that we cancel each other for. So we really do. We have a real journey together in this film. And you never know when you show up to set and you've got a pro like Graham showing up next to you, but just meeting him in the Walgreens and having a 20 minute conversation with him before we, you know, saw each other on set the next day. It was kismet. It was almost like we were meant to be brought together to tell the story together. And I think we both really felt the responsibility of that. And I just remember meeting him. And after I first met him, I was like, wow, this is going to be really fun to tell this story with him. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice? or What's the most BS piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Oof, that's a good one. Be where you are. I had a few people tell me that. One that really has always resonated with me was my acting teacher in New York City, Terry Schreiber. Just again, a lover of actors. I love acting teachers that just love it out of you, that don't need to break you down. I think that that's kind of silly in a way. The trust that you have with your acting teacher really can make you go places that you didn't even think you were capable of. But... A lot of it has to do with the journey. A lot of it has to do with understanding that you're not in control of everything. You can look at your career as a business, but there is opportunity that it needs to come your way. So you have to understand that enjoying the auditions. Michelle Hurd also said this on set. 
spent, you know, an evening talking, watching the sunset and she just imparted all of this beautiful knowledge to me. I'm just big sister vibes, just love her. And she still finds so much joy in every opportunity that she gets to audition. And I feel like I've even gotten away from that sometimes. You're getting frustrated about not getting the gig, not getting the role. And I think if you can just enjoy the journey of it, listen, this is an audition and I'm going to do everything that I can do within my power and I'm going to bring myself fully to this project and to this role. But at the end of the day, I'm not the casting director. I'm not the producer. I'm not the EP. Like I'm not making the final decision on this casting. So the best that I can do is free myself from that and just enjoy the process of getting to be an actor because I get to be an actor today. That's what Michelle says. I get to be an actor today. And the way she says it, she means it. And you find yourself circled around those people. And this is why I say so many people on set somewhere in Montana, like you can see the joy that they have in doing what they love and the meaning that it has for them personally in their own journeys that you have to take everything as a win. And I think that's probably the biggest thing that I've I've learned in, in my acting career because I got away from it, especially when I first moved to LA, being non-union, at least in film and, and TV, then becoming union, you know, and, and not really getting as many auditions and feeling like I couldn't get in the door. The audition is the win. The audition is the opportunity to connect with a casting director. If you go in and, you know, you have a great conversation with the casting director, I have had wonderful conversations with casting directors before in the room, um, pre-COVID, I guess, because that's not as much anymore, where we've actually forgotten to even do the scene because I had already kind of demonstrated my ability to be likable, to be somebody that you'd want on set, which also matters, right? Yeah. Some of these projects, you're going to be on set for a month, month and a half. You want to be on set with people that you like, right? I think that a lot of people really need to understand that this is not an easy gig for most. For most, you know, a lot of actors do need a side gig to keep the dream alive. You know, there's two types of people in the world, the ones that are, are seeking contentment and the ones that are obsessed with the dream. And I've always felt like for me, I've been obsessed with this dream, but you have to enjoy that dream. You can't let it burden you. You have to really embrace the joy of it. I actually just met a family member for lunch with her mom and dad, and she's just getting into acting in uh, Florida, and she's booked a couple great gigs. And that's exactly what me and my wife told her is, you know, enjoy every part of it, like enjoy it. There are times now when I think about me and my wife, like doing audition tapes at 2 a.m. and like for whatever weird short film that we were, but we just had so much fun doing it. It was just so fun. Like we would joke about our outtakes and we would like, you know, I, I, just silly, silly stuff that's on tape somewhere on my computer or whatever that I look back on. And I'm like, I can just see how much joy there is. And for me, this film was such a gift, regardless of the outcome, which obviously I want to be great because I believe in the film, but it was such a win for me because it reinstilled the joy of storytelling for me, Matt, and it instilled the need to collaborate because there were so many great collaborators in our cast and crew that for me, the next step is with my wife to now dive into making our first feature film with Dragon Hunter Productions and bringing a story like Brandon did to his little corner of the world in Polson, Montana, to my original corner of the world in Front Royal, Virginia. I was going to ask, uh, you know, what type of stories you're looking to do now currently. So what's the stage you're currently at with that? And do you have a basic title or a code word title for it? Well, I lucked out. I have a very incredibly talented wife, uh, Laura Hunter Drago. If you want to look her up on Instagram, she actually won um, uh, the best podcast script last year at Austin Film Festival. Nice. So we have a couple podcasts uh, available on Dragon Hunter Productions, um, The Crime at Camp Ashwood, and um, Children of the Stigmata, uh, St. Mary's Children of the Stigmata. Um, so we did a couple podcasts. We got to hire actors, which was really awesome. 
Uh, now the next step is getting into the feature film, right? The Big Fish. And she's already won an award for uh, a script that is a Christmas movie set in our hometown. And it's uh, our hometown originally actually on the map used to be called Helltown. <laughs> and so we, uh, we felt like Christmas in Helltown was a little bit too much. So we did Christmas in Helton. We renamed it Helton. <laughs> um, but it's a really beautiful story. Like I said, it's already won Northern Virginia Film Festival's best script. Mm -hmm. um, it was a finalist at Richmond this year. And it's just, uh, it, it's, it's kind of a, a, a story almost in a way like somewhere in Montana where it's kind of someone coming back to what they knew um, or someone coming from the outside in. It's an actress that is from Front Royal, Virginia that moves to LA and comes back almost like us, right? And you grow up and you make fun of these little small towns that you're from and you're like, oh, the second that I'm out of here, I'm out of here. But man, there's parts of it now that like when I go back to Virginia, I, I'll turn on like the shitty radio and I'll hear a song and I'll just start crying, making those same drives that I, I mean, you just, nostalgia starts to hit deep at a certain point in your life. Like it really, really does. And I think that's what Laura and I are leaning into right now is what can we do like in our lives that will feel full circle? And the natural thing for both both of us is to produce and, and write and um, and act in a, a film and, and more importantly, to bring all of the people together that we know in that little town to be a part of it because we want this to be a team effort. We want to, you know, ask for that lumber yard to donate something or, or, or give a, you know, or help us with this. And we want to use the relationships that we've had our whole life so that this film can be as much theirs as it is ours. And that's the joy of film. I mean, it is, it takes everyone. I, for the first time in my life, looking at the credits of somewhere in Montana, like I know every single person that is on those credits mm -hmm. and I have relationships with all of them. And it's a really, really beautiful thing because you realize how much everybody is a master of craft. You have to let everybody be a master of their own domain. And it's basically setting up your own team and just letting them run with it. And there's just so much joy in that. I think as much as I, love being an actor and I do I think I also really love being a collaborator mm -hmm. and being a collaborator really is kind of this next step for me and I think um, I joke with Brandon Smith all the time I said you know you you gave me this role of Fabian but I carry this role on with me now as Matt because now I feel like I have this need to tell stories and that's Dragon Hunter Productions um you know um main goal in, in, in our productions is to, again, do like Fabian did and bring little stories to little corners of the world that feel like they don't have a voice and need to be heard because we have a lot of stories about New York and LA and Chicago and they're all good, right? But sometimes we need to invest in, in those little pocket cities of, 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 the, of the world and, and, and the country and especially more now than ever I think it's really, really great when people feel like they have a voice and they're being seen and heard. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? My wife. She really is. She's been in it since I can remember. We met in New York City. We have a great story. We found out we basically lived three blocks away from each other in a small Virginia town in Front Royal, only to meet in that class in New York City at Terry Schreiber's studio in Chelsea, kismet. She went to Tish. I went to Marymount. We've been through this journey together. We lift each other up. We've been through pretty much all of our adult ups and downs at this point. We fight for each other. We see each other. We understand each other. There's no greater joy, you know, than collaborating with someone you love. That is uh, in and of itself just a true gift in my life. From a professional standpoint, you are a very successful actor and producer. You're going to be making your very first feature, and I can't wait to see that as well, which means you have to come back on and talk about that when you're ready. 
not not saying Absolutely. no pressure uh do it within the next year no just kidding yes let's <laughs> so, do it so from a professional standpoint you are successful do you consider yourself personally successful Ooh, that's a good one i'm getting there i think i feel accomplished right now but I have been through enough downs in my acting career to not get too up. I want to utilize this film that is a very important film to me, but I think also is a great film. And seeing it for the second time, because I just saw it, I was like, not looking at my performance as much, like really just looking at the film in its totality. And I just, I've dreamed of being in films like this my whole life. But I also know that you can't just wait for the phone to ring in life. You have to make moves. You have to advocate for yourself. And so I think that for me, collaborating and making sure that I'm keeping the momentum going is essential for me to make sure that I keep feeling like I'm moving down the path that I need to. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Mm, I work out. <laughs> I work out. I'm a, a lifelong martial artist. I'm a fourth degree black belt in Okinawan Shonru. Uh, my father is my sensei. I grew up like a ninja turtle. I have three other brothers. <laughs> I could go on and on. Um, so I've always kind of been a physical guy, whether it's doing kata, shadow boxing, working out. I try to exert the energy that way I can get back into myself because the reality is you can't dwell on anything too long in life or you won't be able to move forward. So a lot of times a good workout just kind of recenters me, saying some mantras, just trying to move on to the next because you can't control everything in life, but what you can control is yourself. And so I do my best and I have good days and bad days uh, as anybody does to really try to just do a quick workout, figure out what my next step is to make my dreams keep going and, and stay alive. Which Ninja Turtle are you then? Oh yeah, well, my brother Richard lives on a, a boat in Alaska and he's kind of like a little bit out there. So he's Michelangelo. One of them uh, got a full ride to Bennington, perfect score on his SAT. So that would be Donatello. My brother, Michael, he's always kind of been like his own like just kind of like he'll he'll do his own thing, right? He's like very like Raphael, right? right? In in his own way. So that leaves me as Leonardo. Nice. Well played. <laughs> Which I got to interview the actor uh, who played Leonardo in the original Ninja Turtles. So that was fun. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. It's still one of my favorite movies. Yes. That's yes. like that that's like one of those celebrities I'd just be like Dude, I, uh, I don't even know what to say right now. I grew up on watching that. Yeah, I had two minutes with him at most at a comic convention. I asked him a couple of quick questions, and he was so nice and so awesome. Just, It's still one of my most watched YouTube short. All Me right. too. Me too. <laughs> the younger generation is looking at your work, and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? By just creating. Keeping the creative mechanism going. Whatever that means to you, I, I can't give you that, but just wake up every day. If this is what you want your life to be and it's important to you, figure out ways to be creative. Sometimes that does mean trying to figure out how to get that agent you know, meeting or postcard a bunch of casting directors that you're in a film. Like try to figure out ways to be creative every day and make that not a want, make it a need. If your life was a movie, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Oh man, I've gotten that question before. I still oh, don't know how to answer it. That's a tough one. Oh man, what would the title be and what would the soundtrack be? I feel like I know the soundtrack because I'm just such a big fan of like Rocky. Nice. But I just, it's some of my favorite workout music. Obviously, uh, the guy in Rocky Four has a great last name. Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> what is it again? It's Drake. Um, hmm. not, not to be confused with that Harry Potter, whatever. He's, right, the, right, he's exactly. the original. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I hope it will be a journey well traveled. That would be my hope. And I feel like I'm really in the 
sweetest spot of my life right now where I'm just grateful for it. I'm just grateful for all of it. It hasn't come easy to me. A lot of things that are worth it in life don't. And that's not being down on myself. I have been down on myself, but I'm just grateful for it. I'm grateful for the people that are around me right now. I'm grateful for my reps that work hard for me. I'm grateful for the actors that I've gotten to meet on set and somewhere in Montana and different projects. I'm grateful for my wife and how much she's just like busting her ass to write project after project. And and I'm just grateful for everybody that raises me up in my life, whether it's in acting or just my day to day, you know, it's important to surround yourself with people that just constantly lift you up and never bring you down. When it's all said and done, I think I am very much a Fabian Verdugo. I think I've realized more and more why this part was meant for me is because I'm driven by legacy and I really do. I want to leave a a few good stories behind. That's like always been my dream. If I have to think back to even when I was a kid, like I was always creating, always imagining. If I can leave a couple good stories behind that matter, that maybe, you know, surpass the test of time, that's a journey well lived in my book. Well, Matt, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Kurt. This was a blast. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is Matt on the World Wide Web? And where can we find somewhere in Montana? Yes. So definitely start on my Instagram. I'm terrible at Facebook. Uh, I'm not that great at TikTok, but I am on Instagram at Matt Drago, M-A-T-T-D-R-A-G-O. All of my links are there. I've got my link tree there to my IMDb, um, my websites, both for Dragon Hunter Productions and my actor website. So you can find everything. Just go to uh, Matt Drago and give me a follow and you'll see everything there. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and 1,200 plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-W-O, not the number two. Don't go to that website. It's really not someplace you want to go, trust me. Go to our YouTube channel. That's always updated because our website's going through a revamp. YouTube.com forward slash tgtmedia, the podcast. You can find this interview and all many others at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search Two Geeks Talking wherever you get your podcasts. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.